You're listening to The Philosopher's Note on The Fountainhead. More wisdom in less time. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome to The Philosopher's Notes on The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. Jump right into a quote. It does not matter that only a few in each generation will grasp and achieve the full reality of man's proper stature, and the rest will betray it. It is those few that move the world and give life its meaning, and it is those few that I have always sought to address. The rest are no concern of mine. It is not me or the fountainhead that they will betray. It is their own souls. End quote. That's Ayn Rand from the introduction to The Fountainhead. So Ayn Rand, that's how you pronounce her name, Ayn. uh, She's kind of like a female version of Nietzsche. He was known to deliver his philosophy with a hammer. Same with Rand. You never need to wonder what she was thinking as she writes in a remarkably direct, brilliantly passionate voice. Deeply influenced by the devastation of her family during the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, Rand came to the United States as a 21-year-old and brought with her a disdain for all things imposed from the outside. In this note, we're not going to get into objectivism or have a discussion about the pros and cons of Rand's philosophy. Rather, as we always do, we're going to take a quick peek at some of the many big ideas from her seminal book, The Fountainhead. And, most importantly, we'll explore how we can apply these ideas to our lives now. Before we jump in, I will offer this. For those who have not read Rand yet, The Fountainhead focuses on the story of Howard Rourke, the hero who embodies her ideals and plays with a cast of characters in a world that does anything but honor his genius. It's a portrait of the struggle inherent to the process of embodying one's greatness. While Atlas Shrugged, A 1,000-plus page magnum opus, on the other hand, focuses more on the question of what would happen if the leaders of the industrial world went on strike? They're both awesome. I highly recommend you hold yourself up for a weekend or two, or three or four, and get through at least one of her books if you're feeling it. For now, let's jump in. Real quick character overview. Rourke is the hero. Dominique... I actually named a dog after her, is the heroine, and Keating and Tui are the anti-heroes. So we start with the big idea, own your greatness. Quote, anything may be betrayed, anyone may be forgiven, but not those who lack the courage of their own greatness. End quote. So whatever your opinion of Rand's philosophy, you have to admire her unrelenting belief in the human spirit, and you should be familiar with her ideas. So do you have the courage to hold the space for your own greatness? Signs you may not. You think even the idea of striving for greatness is arrogant, selfish, egoic, not for you, etc. Signs you do. In spite of the monumental challenges society gives us in the process of overcoming our conditioning, you still get up, at least most mornings, with a firm commitment to live your greatest life. If you're somewhere in between, time to read more Philosopher's Notes. (laughs) That should do the trick, I hope. So, uh, next big idea, you are not a second-hander. Howard Rourke, the hero, says this to another hero called Gail Winand. He says, quote, You were not born to be a second-hander. Ah, the second-hander. For those who haven't read The Fountainhead yet, the second-hander is the one who lives for others, always striving to impress others and to do the right thing, while selling his or her soul in the process. How about you? Are you living like a second-hander, too easily acquiescing to the demands of others, society, and family? We all get stuck in that trap at times, but watch out. I say to you, you were not born to be a second-hander. The next big idea is, I love you. Quote, to say I love you, one must know first how to say the I. Wow, I love that. I'm stating the obvious here. We must have a sense of who we are and have true love for ourselves if we are ever going to truly love another right? 
So, do you know how to say the I? How about the next big idea? Show me your achievement. Mallory, who's a young artist in the Fountainhead, says to Rourke, quote, don't help me or serve me, but let me see it once because I need it. Don't work for my happiness, my brothers. Show me yours. Show me that it is possible. Show me your achievement, and the knowledge will give me the courage for mine. End quote. So this is a really interesting sticky point with Rand's philosophy vis-a-vis the attitude of most spiritual seekers these days. When we evolve from being perhaps too focused on getting what we want in life, just for ourselves, we, at least I had this issue, tend to then go too far the other way and make it all about service. But it isn't all about service. Rand, in her typical fashion, goes to the absolute limit of the logic of the fact that we must take care of ourselves first if we want to be truly helpful to others, and tells us, quote, don't help me or serve me, but let me see it once because I need it. Don't work for my happiness, my brothers. Show me yours. Show me that it is possible. Show me your achievement, and the knowledge will give me the courage for mine. I like to think of it like we go through three stages. One, unconscious selfishness. It's all about me or you. Two, Wacky selflessness, it's never about you, or so we'd like to think. And then three, conscious selfishness. As I express myself, follow my bliss, live my greatest life, I naturally give myself to the world. But that wasn't necessarily my starting point, the idea of giving myself to the world. And Rand would say it definitely shouldn't be. Does that make sense? All this reminds me of Abraham Maslow and Marianne Williamson. First, Maslow. He says, quote, the dichotomy between selfishness and unselfishness disappears altogether in healthy people because in principle, every act is both selfish and unselfish. He also says, and this is where he's profiling the self-actualizing individual. You can see the notes on this where I go into more detail. He says, quote, duty cannot be contrasted with pleasure nor work with play when duty is pleasure. When work is play, and people doing their duty are simultaneously seeking pleasure and being happy. And he continues, If the most socially identified people are themselves the most individualistic people, of what use is it to retain the polarity? If the most mature are also the most childlike, and if the most ethical and moral people are also the lustiest and most animal. End quote powerful stuff. You get to a point where the dichotomies dissolve. The apparent paradox takes care of itself. And now how about Williamson? Although Marion Williamson is a near polar opposite of Ayn Rand in many, perhaps almost always, both she and Rand would agree that, quote, as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. So how about you? Are you spending too much time helping others? and serving others, but not truly serving yourself? In my opinion, life is definitely about service. But let's never forget that the greatest service we can ever give the world and the people we love is our own happiness, our own actualization. So let's shine today, shall we? And I'll share the full quote from Marianne Williamson that I just quoted partially. She says, quote, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. End quote. Now I have a little note here that's often and mistakenly believed to be from Nelson Mandela's inauguration speech. It is not. It's from Williamson's book, A Return to Love. You can see page 191, if you don't believe me. Brilliant stuff. 
Okay, so the next big idea is we must love the doing. Quote, you must be the kind of man who can get things done. But to get things done, you must love the doing, not the secondary consequences. So how about you? Are you working for the secondary consequences? The money, the prestige, the recognition? Eek. Or are you working because you simply love the doing? And that begs the question, what do you really love doing? Figure that out. Do it a lot. Watch your happiness explode. All right, the next big idea, on purpose. Peter Keating, this is one of the anti-heroes, says, quote, Do you always have to have a purpose? Do you always have to be so damn serious? Can't you ever do things without reason, just like everybody else? You're so serious, so old. Everything's important with you. Everything's great, significant in some way, every minute, even when you keep still. Can't you ever be comfortable and unimportant? Howard Rourke, the hero, says, no. That is genius. Now, to be sure, if you don't intend to make the most of your life, live as a second-hander, etc., etc., the above, and while this whole note, and most of my notes for that matter, might be more than a little annoying to extreme, right? If that's what you're thinking, remember Maslow's admonition. He said, quote, If you deliberately plan on being less than you are capable of being, then I warn you that you'll be unhappy for the rest of your life. And Joseph Campbell puts the need to be intense about our actualization process another way. He quotes Sri Ramakrishna saying, Do not seek illumination unless you seek it as a man whose hair is on fire seeks a pond. So as always, the spotlight is back on you. Are you living on purpose? Do you have the courage for your own greatness? And then the next big idea, pure white bliss. Quote, she knew she could not have reached this white serenity except as the sum of all the colors, of all the violence she had known, end quote. I love that. First, did you know that white is simply the sum of all colors? Yep. The sun, for example, sends white light down to our little planet, light composed of all the colors of the spectrum that we can't see. Unless, of course, there are some funky atmospheric conditions that bend the light rays and creates a rainbow. Pretty cool, huh? Of course, you can also use a prism to demonstrate that fact. So as Rand so beautifully captures, if we want white light, we've got to mix all the colors. The pain, the suffering, and all the not-so-pretty colors are what give us the strength, the wisdom, the compassion, and the overall mojo to let our light shine. Powerful stuff. So I say we smile at all the challenges that have given us the spectrum of experience we need to let our white lights fully shine. And for the record, black is the absence of color. It's the inability, or the unwillingness technically, to allow the full spectrum of life's experiences to penetrate us so deeply that we emerge as pure light. When we fail to see the good and the bad, the pain and the joy within ourselves, we tend to, as Jung says, project our shadow, that would be black, right, onto the world in the form of criticism, irritation, frustration, etc. So let's go full spectrum. Accept it all. Turn on your light. The next big idea is independence. One of the other anti-heroes of the book, Tui, says to Rourke, our hero, he says, quote, tell me what you think of me. And Rourke says, but I don't. <laughs> the context there is that Tui has spent his life trying to destroy Rourke's life. Can you imagine saying that to someone who has dedicated his life to destroying yours? Tell me what you think of me. But I don't. <laughs> That's genius. Let's get too busy creating and living our ideal lives and too independent of the good or bad opinion of others to even think about our critics or what they may be thinking or saying about us. Powerful. How about this? Comparisons. Rourke says, quote, I don't make comparisons. I never think of myself in relation to anyone else. I just refuse to measure myself as part of anything. I'm an utter egotist, end quote. So in this note, we don't have the space to go into what an egotist is, but the point is, quit comparing yourself to others, period. As Emerson would say, envy is ignorance. Imitation is suicide. You might want to rewind and re-listen to that. 
envy, or I'll just repeat it for you. Envy is ignorance. Imitation is suicide. He's using those words literally. To envy is to be ignorant of the divinity within you. To imitate is to miss that divinity seeking its unique expression through you. So don't compare. Let's follow Faulkner's advice, who says, don't bother just to be better than your contemporaries or predecessors. Try to be better than yourself. Here's another big idea. Know what you want. Rourke says this to Keating. If you want my advice, Peter, he said at last, you've made a mistake already by asking me, by asking anyone. Never ask people, not about your work. Don't you know what you want? How can you stand it not to know? That sums it up, huh? Are you looking to everyone outside yourself for hints on who you are and what you should do or how you should do it? That's a great way to live as a second-hander. Not so good if you want to be happy. As Joseph Campbell says, you can see the notes on this, quote, You enter the forest at the darkest point, where there is no path. Where there is a way or a path, it is someone else's path. You are not on your own path. If you follow someone else's way, you are not going to realize your potential. End quote. So where there is a path, you know that it's not yours. Someone else's advice on what path you should take is not going to be your authentic path. Trust yourself. A little Emerson seems appropriate here. He says, quote, Trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. Accept the place the divine providence has found for you. The society of your contemporaries. The connection of events. Great men have always done so and confided themselves childlike to the genius of their age betraying their perception that the absolutely trustworthy was seated at their heart, working through their hands, predominating in all their being. And we are now men, and must accept in the highest mind the same transcendent destiny, and not minors and invalids in a protected corner, not cowards fleeing before a revolution, but guides, redeemers and benefactors, obeying the almighty effort and advancing on chaos and the dark. End quote. Ah, I love Emerson. Emerson and Rand together. Good combination. Uh, Two more big ideas. The next one, the greatest kind of courage. Quote, why do they always teach us that it is easy and evil to do what we want and that we need discipline to restrain ourselves? It's the hardest thing in the world to do what we want, and it takes the greatest kind of courage. End quote. That's genius. Again, what do you want? And do you have the courage to go for it? I know the answer to that is yes, so good. All right, and here's the final big idea, our greatness. This is the same quote we use to kick the party off. We're going to end with it. Quote, anything may be betrayed. Anyone may be forgiven, but not those who lack the courage of their own greatness. It does not matter that only a few in each generation will grasp and achieve the full reality of man's proper stature and the rest will betray it. It is those few that move the world and give life its meaning, and it is those few that I have always sought to address. The rest are no concern of mine. It is not me or the fountainhead that they will betray. It is their own souls. End quote. Again, anything may be betrayed. Anyone may be forgiven. But according to Rand, not those who lack the courage of their own greatness. I'll throw in an amen there. Well, that's one way to get through the big ideas of a 700-plus page book. (laughs) I trust you've had at least one aha, and I trust you're going to live it starting now. With love and a kick in the butt on this precious hero's journey of ours, I wrap up that part of this note. Hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you'd like to stay tuned, I will give you a quick overview of Ayn Rand and... uh, lead you through some of the quotes in the sidebar of the note. So uh, Ayn Rand, the author of The Fountainhead, she's kind of like a female version of Nietzsche, as I mentioned. He was known to deliver his philosophy with a hammer. Same with Rand. You never need to wonder what she was thinking as she writes in a remarkably direct, brilliantly passionate voice. Deeply influenced by the devastation of her family during the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, 
Rand came to the United States as a 21-year-old and brought with her a disdain for all things imposed from the outside, and developed her remarkably intense philosophy of personal choice and freedom. You can Google her to learn more about her philosophy and check out the YouTube videos for some intense classic interviews with her and Mike Wallace. Amazing stuff from the 50s, I believe. Um, you can see her Google Ayn Rand, A-Y-N Rand, and Mike Wallace in YouTube, and you'll find some amazing videos. So if you like this note, I also think you'll like Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Nietzsche. I think you'll like Abraham Maslow's Motivation and Personality, and I think you will like A Joseph Campbell Companion. Now for some of those quotes I promised. From Samuel Goldwyn, he says, Don't pay attention to the critics. Don't even ignore them. Brilliant. (laughs) Rand says, The secrets of this earth are not for all men to see, but only for those who will seek them. She also says, There are two sides to every issue. One side is right, and the other is wrong. But the middle is always evil. In other words, pick a position. Uh, Ayn Rand also says, You know what you are actually in love with. Integrity, the impossible, the clean, consistent, reasonable, self-faithful, the all-of-one style, like a work of art. And finally, we'll end with a Nietzsche quote. Nietzsche says, But whoever would become light in a bird must love himself. Thus I teach, one must learn to love oneself with a wholesome and healthy love, so that one can bear to be with oneself and need not roam. That's tied to the Ayn Rand quote, To say I love you, one must first know how to say the I. That is a quick look at one of my favorite books, The Fountainhead, and I hope you enjoyed it and very much look forward to sharing the next note with you and trust you're doing great. Have an awesome day. See ya. We hope you enjoyed this Philosopher's Note. Please go to www.philosophersnotes.com to download more.